Welcome back to Render School. The topic of the day is global illumination. Um, something we all gotta know and love. Um, I have the scene set up very, very simply. Um, we've got one of the Stanford uh, dinosaur dragon models here. I'm um, gonna hide this guy for now. And. We have a box and we have an HDR in the background. Um, just uh, basically, it's a, it's a dome light. I should make this spherical actually. And I have piped a low resolution HDRI image into that and made sure that it's interpreted as linear. And that gives us this wonderful image. Um, so that really shouldn't be uh, anything particularly new to you guys if uh, you've been following along on the other videos. So let's do something new. Um, I'm just going to pop up the render settings and uh, go into the Interact Illumination tab, which is uh, basically global illumination. Um, but I guess this is probably the correct word for it. So right off the bat, I can just click on here and uh, we can actually start rendering with GI on, but I'm just going to lower the uh, preset just so, uh, so it doesn't take too long. And you see V-Ray does this uh, pre-pass or a couple of pre-passes and then starts rendering. And all of a sudden we get this uh, slightly softer, bounce light, nice image here which is exactly what we want. So I'm just going to uh, go through uh, some of these settings one by one, um, just so that you uh, you see what it is that they do. And first off, I'm going to grab this guy, I have a V-Ray material on him, and go down to Refraction. And let's just turn that up pretty high and give it a bit of saturation. And you might wonder why on earth is he doing that. And I'm going to check off refractive caustics to show you. So if I go in here and do a quick render, um, it turned back on. Why on earth did it do that? That's a really bad example if it does that. OK, so now you see we have this. This could be a window or whatever. and just doing pure GI, that's actually going to act as a light blocker. So you see it gets really dark in here, uh, basically because it will only take into account the diffuse part of, uh, um, of this object when doing the whole bounce around thing. So if we click on refractive caustics, it will actually start shining light through. We get some very interesting effects. Uh, this could be windows with an HDR outside or, or whatever. Um, so it's uh, just nice to know what on earth that is. It does produce a slightly caustic -y effect. Uh, you know that nice underwater lighting or light going through a glass bowl or whatever, but um, in a very soft and uncontrollable manner. But it is good to be aware of so that you don't get into situations like this where it would get really dark. Um, and in case you're wondering, it works the exact same way with uh, reflective caustics. So if you just brighten this up a little bit, um, see it gets it gets dark in here because it's not actually taking the reflection of the light into account when it's doing the uh, uh, global illumination or indirect illumination. Whereas if we check this button on, actually just to make it more interesting, let's give it a bit of color. And you see now light actually bounces uh, in the in the GI and uh, gives us the effect we were looking for. Do bear in mind that especially the reflective caustics tend to be very, uh, say, lively. Uh, they introduce a lot of noise, um, 
and, and a flickery, uh, flickery stuff in there. So just uh, be a little bit wary about when you want to use them. Also, if you want to bake, uh, like to fly through stuff and bake your GI, um, this can, uh, again, produce some weird things. But I am just taking all these things from the top and uh, we're going to go back to just having refractive caustics on, which is the uh, default. Also, I am just going to move this guy out a little bit. If I could just select them as such. And I will let you know in a bit why I did that. So, uh, post-processing is basically color correction on our global illumination. So if you want more saturation, contrast, uh, stuff like that in there, uh, you can go ahead and, and play with it here. I would, uh, at any given time, prefer to do this um, as a post thing in, inside of Nuke, because it is, it's a lengthy thing to render your GI, and then like if you have to have to, to change your settings around, stuff like that, in here and do a re-render, uh, you'll you'll spend a lot of time doing that. So next up is ambient occlusion. Um, let me just pop a quick render up here. What ambient occlusion does here is pretty much just um, render an ambient occlusion layer and use that in here as well. The reason you'd want to do that is to get more uh, detail in your GI. <clears throat> I'll just do a quick render like this, um, set the radius up a bit, and set the multiplier up just so we see more of it. Uh, that should just darken. See, we get some darker contact shadows here. Um, so it's the same thing as rendering out an ambient occlusion pass and, uh, and, and multiplying that on top. But here you just get it inside the render, so uh, you've got to figure out where you want to spend your time if you want to spend it doing re-renders where you do stuff here or if you want to do it after after the uh, your render is completed inside of nuke uh, i would definitely prefer the latter again because it's more flexible but it is nice to have the option and then we get into the uh or i guess uh stuff that makes more of a difference uh Primary and secondary bounces. Primary bounces is uh, rays shot out of the camera, depending on which engine you're using, um, seeing other things, and then uh, pretty much rendering your global illumination based off of what you can see from your render. Um, so stuff that's immediately reflective and like pixels that are actually rendered inside of your final image. Whereas if you turn on secondary bounces, you actually start calculating stuff that's all over the place as well, which gives you uh, usually a better result, a bit brighter, because uh, you will be adding more light in there. But um, very often you don't really need this, but it's it's a nice little thing. Uh, I'm going to get into the engines in just a second, uh, but you should be aware of the multipliers you have. Um, if you really don't want that much of your secondary bounce, you can actually turn it down. Same thing with the primary. Just be aware that as soon as you dial these guys down, you're moving away from what's physically correct um, and into the world of art. So go ahead and do it by all means, but um, just be aware of that. And last but not least in this first rollout, we have raid distance. Um, and I bet you already have a good idea what that's all about. But just in case, I'm just going to create this magnificent uh, render. I just turned off the, the uh, dome light and made this uh, sphere, or sorry, this box uh, self-illuminant. So basically what ray distance will do is it will only do GI within this distance. Now my scene is, I think it's like, uh, let's actually, let's try it. I think there's probably like 10 units between these two guys. A uh, bit less. So if we dial this down, you can see that 
the GI doesn't shoot off as far as it did before. So, set to three, goes a bit further. Um, there are several reasons why you want to do this. Uh, the main reason in my eyes is that you can control stuff uh, very precisely uh, using this, especially if you get like really complex scenes that start acting up. It's it's very nice to know that you have the ability to do this. But again, it is it's an artistic choice um, that might move you out of the realm of uh, of realism. But it, it's again something to be aware of, uh, especially if your scenes start uh, acting weird. So yeah, bear that in mind that you have that option. Same thing like on your reflections. Remember we had. We had that option in there. So that was just really quickly going through this top rollout thing. But um, some more interesting stuff. I was just at the secondary bounces to none. We have these different engines for calculating um, RGI. I'm going to touch on the irradiance map, the brute force, and the light cache. Um, as a photon map is, uh, it's probably harsh saying useless, but it's just, it doesn't offer a lot of stuff that light cache doesn't do, but it does give you a lot of headaches. So I'm not really going to touch that and spherical harmonics. I've never wrapped my head around. So, uh, I, I, I can't honestly say that I could explain that to you. So irradiance map is the default uh, primary bounce um, engine. And it does these pre-passes and pretty much just like averaging between um, the pre-passes to create your uh, final GI map. Um, it has some presets that I'd have to say, I, I usually just go with a preset because they are really good but you can go ahead and customize it. And if you think of the adaptive sampling, it's the same thing you got here. Um, minimum and maximum um, size, how, how much you want to subdivide it. If you set this to zero, it's actually going to, uh, set any of them to zero. It's going to uh, calculate the irradiance map per pixel. That's probably going to be really slow. But it does, I give you a lot of, uh, of of nice details, but if you are going down this route, I'd probably suggest using brute force, because um, here we're just getting annoying stuff. Um, so uh, you want to keep these somewhat low, but not ultra low, because that's just going to introduce a lot of flicker, which we do not want. So, um, subdivisions and interpolation uh, samples. Basically, subdivisions is the amount of uh, points where V-Ray will sample for you. And interpolation samples is how many rays it will sample with. So, um, subdivs will, the higher your subdivs are, the more detail you'll get in there. And the higher your interpolation samples are the, let's say, the odds of your uh, sample flickering is going to be reduced because it's going to sample more stuff. So it's going to clean it up a whole lot, but also slow it down, of course. Interpolation frames comes into play if you have a, uh, a sequence, uh, like a, a pre-cached sequence of, uh, of, of your GI. If you have this set to two, for example, it's going to look two frames before and two frames after, plus the frame you're on. So that's going to uh, reduce flickering a whole lot. Um, but the higher you take this, the more you're going to get some sort of, I want to say, ghosting effect, um, depending on how much your stuff moves. Of course, if it's an architectural fly-through, then you're good. But if it's a creature, then you're not so good. Um, so, and, and also for the fly-throughs, we have better ways. 
but um, yeah, you can sometimes if stuff is, is uh, flickering just a tad, you can just up this and, and and get rid of some of that. Color normal and distance threshold is uh, again if you if you think of this as our uh, adaptive TMC, for example, you got the threshold here. You can just say, do you want to use it? Do you want to like the threshold should be based on the color, the normal of the object, uh, or the distance between the points. But again, um, I seriously, seriously suggest uh, starting out with the presets because they're very good. Um, next up is enhance details. If you have this on, uh, you can either in screen space or world space have uh, the sample or this radius that will sample if there's supposed to be more details and if there is it will actually uh, multiply your subdivs so you get um, nicer nicer results um, so if you have like a large plane but with something really intricate in there uh, detail enhancement will uh, give that Bit of geometry, some extra love. Um, again, either based in screen space or world space. Um, world space makes sense if you're doing a lot of low res renders, and all of a sudden you want to render high res and uh, stuff uh, is is further away in screen space uh, than it was before. But usually, it's a good screen space is a good place to start. Um, and it works really well. It, it can slow down your scenes a lot. Um, this is radius, it will, how far it will look, uh, if it should be, like, a, how far an area it will add more detail to. And this is the multiplier for how much extra detail. Um, so depending on how high you set this, you can really make your scene slow, but you can actually get some very, very nice results. Uh, show samples will basically just when we do our render um, actually show the samples uh, instead of doing interpolation between them um, it's just going to show the GI uh, we have some slightly better ways of doing that which I'm going to show you in a second um, so this is more of a troubleshooting kind of thing uh, show calculation phase is always nice to have on because you actually see that it's doing something and you don't feel like you're just waiting. And show direct lights will just show not only the GI that's being calculated, but also um, the other lights that are in the scene. It's not necessary, but it's uh, sometimes sometimes nice to see what's going on. But it's it's uh, for show. Now this last one, use camera path, gets more interesting. So if I was to uh, create a camera like this, here we go, and let me just get rid of this guy, and we'll create a locator, parent the camera under there, uh, let's just get rid of these guys, got frame one, set a keyframe, from 24 and rotate this guy 360 so the keyframe and I hope you're not too wild about this but yeah here we go so let me just find my render settings again now I'm not going to check use camera path yet I'm just gonna hit render wonder oh because that was our only light source sorry about that uh let's just turn on this light hit render and we get our nice beautiful hdr render and i'm actually just going to let it finish so have patience now what it does because i don't check the use camera path is it will only calculate GI for this camera position, as we are right now, um, which makes sense if you're just rendering from here. And to show you that, um, let's 
go into render data. Let's just save our radians. I can never remember the name of this guy. Save our um, no cam. Let's call it that. And I am going to launch the IMAP viewer. The IMAP viewer is um, it, it's in the bin folder for V-Ray, and uh, it's a very useful tool that's not used nearly enough. Uh, see, I can't talk and navigate at the same time. Maya projects and render data. Here we go. Okay. So basically, what this guy will do is load up your um, whatever irradiance map uh, or other cached map you you've got saved, and display just the points. And the navigation is horrible. So just get used to that. I'm just going to switch over to a mouse here. Zoom in. And as you can see, is like if we get it to the right camera angle. It would look all right, but there's nothing on the back side of it. But it will work from here. So if instead we uh, check the use camera path, V-Ray is actually going to calculate. You can see the the uh, pre-pass looks a little bit weird because it's going to actually calculate the whole way around it. Um, basically the whole camera move. This means that we need actually we actually need to get some more points in there because it's going to be a bit lower resolution because uh, it's splitting the uh, uh, sorry the uh, samples out over a larger area but uh, if we hit save and do a here we go uh, yes cam let's call it that And hit C to center it. See, now all of a sudden we have a much larger area because this is all the stuff that we're seeing with this camera. If I could only navigate, there's probably some really clever way of doing this. I just have not figured it out yet. So, this is how I troubleshoot these guys. It's very hard to see. Um, it's a really cool tool, by the way. Uh, just because you can actually see where you're getting your samples. So start using it. I haven't seen a lot of people use it, uh, which is a damn shame. Um, but yeah, we're now actually getting the the GI solution for the whole camera move. What this means is that if I was to, you know, we've saved this out. Uh, we're gonna get into this probably in a later video. Um, I'm going to do a video at some point about uh, baking GI. But I've set this to from file and go into render data, yes cam. Then we can actually go all the way around and hit the render button, and we have the GI solution already loaded. So if you're doing any kind of architectural fly through or whatnot, this is something you're going to appreciate a lot because it, it just really speeds stuff up and there's no flicker because it's just one solution. Um, so you can even afford to up your settings quite a bit because um, it's just going to go through it once. Um, so use that. Um, a lot of people are using the, uh, where is it, incremental add to current map and then rendering, say, every 10 frames or 20 frames, whatever. Uh, but this does the same thing just in a smarter way. So love it. Use it. Um, I can use it right now for what I'm doing because we're just jumping back and forth. <clears throat> but uh, that's a really important one. Interpolation types and sample lookups. I haven't ever really changed that. The only thing I could uh, sometimes change is uh, interpolation type set, set that's Voroni weights, which will give us a little bit of a sharper uh, interpolation. But there's a reason this is called good and smooth, because uh, it is. Uh, same one, this one gets 
Deloin, Delon, whatever, uh, gets very exact, but it requires a lot more samples. So it's a weird trade off. Um, a sample lookup, just keep it uh, density based. Um, you can speed things up a little bit by changing it, but uh, it's not worth it. Check sample visibility. That's an important one, actually. If you have a slightly low res, I don't even know how to show this, but if we had light leaking through, say, because our, our GI solution was so low resolution that I had light uh, peeking through this uh, ground plane, I could actually say check sample visibility because that would shoot an extra ray out to see whether or not whatever was pre-rendered is visible. So it's kind of a double checking, um, cutting stuff away that shouldn't be seen. So if you have light leaking through in your GI solutions, go ahead and, and, and check this guy. It's going to be a little bit slower, but um, that's all good. Uh, Multipass will basically just uh, do one pass at a time while we're going through this whole um, rendering uh, of pre-rendering thing. Um, if you check, if you uncheck this, chances are same with randomized samples that you're going to get a more like odds of you getting the same result from two different machines pressing render on the same scene is like the odds of them being the same are a lot better but it's going to slow things down because it, it's um it it kind of kills multi-threading and stuff like that so um i've never seen it used any of these guys and uh and that's actually it we're not going to get into this mode thing in this video uh, but it mainly has to do with uh rendering animation um and it kind of makes sense so we'll look into that in a later later video <clears throat> but that's the irradiance map the next one we'll look at is brute force and brute force is something that you really shouldn't uh, write off just because it sounds old school and all that but it is brute force uh, monte carlo i think um just going in there and doing its samples there's no optimizations and stuff like that which means in turn that it's not going to flicker it's going to give you noise but it's not going to flicker because it's rendered the good old school way and everything else is just trying to optimize this so for a lot of stuff um, if you're struggling with flicker brute force is a very good way to go um, got subdivs like you've got subdivs in pretty much any other setting of V-Ray, um, which will just clean up your results. They've got some lights that aren't that clean here, so it might not really help that much, but it did slow it down. But um, it's, it is cleaning it up. I don't know if you can see it on the video. Um, but subdivisions and depth, how far it will, um, uh, like how many bounces it's going to do. Uh, three is usually a good number because this this got to be like you can keep bouncing all you want but at some point light just use it loses its intensity um it's it's so nice and simple um it's not that quick but if you know you get rid of your your flicker and you get your details so it's definitely a force to be reckoned with um i'll just run my camera here so uh, so so don't yeah as I said don't write that off. And last one we're going to look at is the light cache. Light cache is kind of a fancy photon mapping uh, engine. So instead of if you do photon uh, use use uh, photons as your engine, it's going to shoot out rays from your lights, bounce those guys around. Uh, It'll take quite a while, and unless you have unlimited samples, it's it's usually not going to look that good. So light cache kind of does the other thing, where it shoots rays out of the uh, camera and hits the lights. Um, so it's a lot more efficient. <clears throat> Sorry, it can even be used with uh, like for for speeding up your your glossy reflections and stuff like that. 
Uh, so it's it's very very useful, but it's not so detailed unless you go ahead and do some some really bad stuff to it. So one thing at a time, a uh, number of passes. Uh, basically, every processor or thread should have a pass, uh, maybe even two. Um, so this will just kind of uh, define how many. Uh, What's a good way of saying it? <clears throat> it's a good way of uh, well, it basically defines how many threads are going and if they're going more more than once going over the same thing. Um, Light cache doesn't really look at what else is going on on the machine, so it'll just shoot out rays, not wondering if that's been shot at before and stuff like that. So usually a good rule of thumb is keep your number of passes to your number of threads. Um, or to some uh, factor of it. Subdivs, again, rule of thumb is um, start with one per pixel of your uh, render uh, width. So I do 640 here. And it doesn't really look that beautiful. Then we have the sample size, how far between samples. Uh, Basically, how sharp should our samples be? Um, so see, I set that down, and all of a sudden, I get these small splotches. Uh, so it kind of means that it, it tries to be very local, but it, uh, of course, I don't have enough subdivs here. So it doesn't work that well, but it doesn't blur out the result, which is nice. Um, I've usually used uh, light caching for interior renders and stuff like that, because it is very, very fast. Um, and if you just keep upping this at some point, you're going to get a very nice result. I'm on a laptop, so I'm not sure I want to keep going. But let's see what happens. Um, but, uh, see, I really want to know what happens now, so I'm just going to stall here. See, we're getting some nice details, but we need to up our subdivs uh, to some pretty high amounts. Uh, the other way of doing it would be to up our sample size, and that would give us a splotchy result. Um, yeah. So, somewhere in between, um, I use light caching usually, yeah, as I said, interior scenes or uh, scenes that have a lot of glossy reflections because it will speed that up if you allow it to. Um, world scale, again, a lot of this stuff is is pixel based. So if you render at a higher resolution, you're actually going to need more subdivs unless you render at world scale, um, which makes it a little bit harder to control, but you can you can trust that whatever you're doing will scale uh, if you render a larger image. Uh, adaptive sampling is kind of like what we had, um, uh, the enhanced detail thing, where it will uh, try and, and be, be clever about it and works pretty well. And again, use camera path will calculate um, the whole camera, uh, the light cache for the whole camera path. and these guys too can be saved and looked at in the IR map viewer. So just uh, use that for God's sake. So moving on, I, sorry, I know it sounds a little bit like I'm not a big fan of this, but I am just not a primary, um, primary bounds engine. I like using it as a secondary thing. So it is really good and really helpful. Um, so once you're done calculating uh, your light cache, we go into reconstruction. And there's a couple of different ways of doing this. Uh, again, nearest has always been my favorite. Uh, that's the default and works pretty well. None will just, like, it, it, it's not going to interpolate. It's just going to grab whatever's closest and not uh, try, at least try and, and make it softer. And fixed is, I think it's some, where I remember it is, um, 
it has I think it's 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 like a quad base, like four different uh it'll grab the four nearest points and average them. But nearest again is, is good for what it does. Pre filtering, kind of like when you're loading up uh, an image, uh you can blur it. So the same thing you can do that here. Um I should soften up things. Um see if it see already we're actually getting a soft result. So it's kind of like pre blurring your um your light cache file. Um this button here. Use light cache for glossy rays. I don't know how it does it, but it will speed up your glossy reflections and refraction quite a bit. Actually sometimes just turning your light cache on will speed up your uh like will make it faster than rendering without GI if you have a lot of glossy stuff or non soft reflections. Um it does something in there that just makes it uh a lot quicker. Depth again how many uh I think it's how many bounces it will do. But it's in reconstruction so I'm confusing myself. Um, filter samples again. You're using your filtering, and how fine should it filter? Um, it's like the quality of the blur, um, and this is the size of the blur. If that makes some kind of sense, it, you just have to imagine that in 3D. Um, and it's definitely, in my eyes, the easiest way of seeing it. Uh, retrace threshold means that um, it will retrace your uh, light cache when it gets to this threshold um, which well basically especially if you're using uh, using it for reflections uh, for glossy reflections you might have a light cache that's pretty good for diffuse reflections global illumination or, or indirect illumination but um, if your cached file doesn't hold up for what uh, V-Ray thinks your uh, your reflection ray should do, it will retrace those rays. Um, so if you're using uh, light cache for glossy rays, you want to make sure to get this guy on as well. I hope that made sense. And in reality, the thing I usually change from the defaults is subtips, size, and use camera path if I'm doing fly throughs and stuff like that. Pre filtering as well, very nice. Turn on glossy rays, turn on retrace threshold, you're golden. Um, and again, there's a few different uh, modes that we're not going to get into here. One thing you might want to play with, I haven't really found use for it, but it's kind of cool, is progressive path tracing, which does um, kind of like a Maxwell style light simulation. Instead of uh, doing anything clever, it's just gonna it's just gonna simulate the lights and it's really cool, but uh, it's horribly horribly slow. Um, so yes, that was a very quick uh, run through of uh, indirect illumination settings, and I hope it made sense. I'm trying to keep these videos somewhat uh, short, so uh, I'm sorry if I've been speed talking. Uh, and it didn't make sense, but uh, you can always rewind. Um, good settings, just to recap. Um, refractive caustics on, because you're going to get confused if they're not. Uh, radiance map for primary bounces and secondary bounces. I usually use light cache. Um, use the presets. Use the camera path if you're doing animation. Down here, uh, up your subdivs, lower your sample size, pre-filter it, and if you have glossy stuff, go ahead and use this. I don't have glossy stuff here, but um, but yeah, that should uh, that should be some pretty pretty good settings to uh, get you started. Um, at least that's the ones I'm using. Um, and also, do not. Uh, stay away from using brute force because it, it it is just really nice it's slow but it does like the right thing so that was um 
V-Ray basics on global illumination. Um, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter on renderschool.com and I will let you know when new stuff comes out. And uh, uh, check out the website as well if there's anything that interests you. And other than that, I appreciate you taking your time to see what I have to say. So thanks and have a good one.